Thank you, Carmela. So, everybody hear me okay? I don't need a mic. Okay, so thank you so much for coming out. This is awesome turnout. And the goal for tonight is that you guys leave here with a lot more base knowledge on the whole process of athletic recruiting. You can't possibly leave here with what you actually need to know. And so, if you want to talk, I can set up a time with you. And it's right on the forum there. Just text that number and I'll set up a time and we can do a Zoom and I can answer more questions. I will try to answer quite a few questions tonight. However, there probably won't be time for everybody and so please take advantage of that, okay? So I'll give you a little bit of my, my background first just to you know who I am. I was a high school teacher and coach for many years, about 30 years ago, and then I uh, coached at the collegiate level for about 10 years as well at five different colleges. These are the high schools and colleges where I've worked I was a women's basketball assistant coach and head coach at Division I and Division II. However, I did coach some track and field, watched my daughter play many, many years of lacrosse, and I've helped with recruiting in literally every sport. I have an equestrian, actually, I'm working with right now from Oak Park, and she's going to do competitive equestrian in college, so that was a new one for me, but uh, tennis, golf, football, everything, I've, I've, done, I've done a lot of it, and the reason that that's doable is because the recruiting process is much the same. I'm not gonna evaluate your son or child, but, uh, but being able to talk about recruiting, the, the information I'm giving is good for any, virtually any sport, okay? And don't get me wrong, the recruiting rules are different. We'll get to that here a little bit later. Uh, before we get rolling with this, what sports do we have here? Do we have any basketball people? I'm a little biased with basketball, quite a few. Lacrosse, I know we talked to a couple, so we've got some lacrosse. Soccer, I know we talked about soccer. Okay, good, very good. Just had a so two soccer players last year. They're freshmen now um, in college. Uh, what about uh, golf? Got any golfers? A couple of golfers. I know we had a golf coach. All right, very good, very good. Um, and, and I know there are many, many others. Raise your hand if, you, if your sport has been called. I'm just curious what sports. What sport do you have? Baseball. Baseball, of course. Tennis. Tennis. Swimming. Swimming. Is that everybody? Volleyball. Volleyball, of course. So today, I was just eating with my kids before my son went to tutoring, and uh, we were at a restaurant. I could see the TV in the distance, and I, I, I grew up in my, in, my, in my teaching and coaching career in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I got to know the coach at the, uh, uh, you're from Lincoln? No, the women's team is Oh, they're really phenomenal, good. phenomenal. So <laughs> Craig Skinner was the assistant coach there. He moved on to Lexington, Kentucky, and I've kept in touch with them all the way. Anyhow, on the TV, it was Louisville, and I think they were playing Kentucky tonight. I'm not sure. Anyhow, volleyball, great sport, wonderful sport. It's, 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 it's incredible with uh, how much it has developed in terms of the viewership. It's really, really picking up. There's a couple other hands here. I'm just curious, other sports? Is that everybody? Okay, what was yours? Uh, ice hockey. Oh, hockey, nice, nice. I wish my son would have stuck with ice hockey. Uh, are you sure about that? <laughs> Probably good advice, probably good advice. Okay, and I'm sorry the slides are not cooperating in terms of the formatting, I didn't realize that until we just started here. But um, Athletic Recruiting 101, so Division One, Division Two, Division Three. raise your hand if you've heard of NCAA, Division One, Division Two, Division Three. Probably a lot of you have, because we've already started the recruiting process, great. There's also another division, does anybody know that one? NAIA, NAIA right? So there's about 250 schools that associate with NAIA. NEIA is a good option for some students, okay? But many, many people don't think it is because of kind of misinformation in terms of what they've seen and heard. NEIA is like the wild, wild west. There are some really good schools, there's some really, really not so good schools academically, and some schools are well-funded and some schools are not funded hardly at all in NEIA. So it's, it's a, there's a big difference there between school to school. So, I would encourage you to continue on with AI and give it a look because, as you'll see here, the whole process is negotiable in terms of scholarships. And when you get, I had a kid who's playing lacrosse in Colorado D2, and she got a good offer from a, an NAI in Kansas, and they offered 20000 a year, and she used that information with the D2 to increase her scholarship. If you want me, I got this great offer over here. Okay, and that, that can be done and it should be done at the right time. Okay, and so NAI can be useful in that regard. 
Um, Division one, though, usually larger schools. You guys know some of this, so I'm going I'm to skip past a lot of the stuff. Larger schools, and they can give full ride scholarships, and they have what's called headcount sports in certain sports. So if your son is football, or if your son is basketball, and they are being recruited Division one, the scholarship is all athletic. There are no partial scholarships. You're either a walk on, and you get nothing. Or your full ride. That's for which sports? Football, Football and basketball. On the women's side in Division One, there's five head count sports to kind of balance it out: basketball, volleyball, I want to say tennis, golf, and gymnastics. And I may have one of those wrong, but I have to look it up. And the other sports in Division One are just like Division Two, where the scholarships for athletics are stackable with academic money and sometimes need-based money, okay? So it's a really nice thing about Division II and the non-headcount sports in D1. Another thing I'll mention about Division I, and this is kind of true of D2 as well, and that is they're not all funded the same, okay? So in other words, if it's a non-headcount sport, which a lot of you guys raise your hand, those are non-headcount sports in, in, in uh, men's and then also in women, some of them. And those sports, some of them, get up to 10 scholarships, up to 11.2 scholarships if they're D2, and if they're D1, it depends on the sport. And one of your QR codes, I'll get to it a little bit later, shows you those numbers. So that's, that sheet is full of really good data. You just click on their various sources and that takes you right to uh, really good information. But the number of scholarships for the sport that the NCAA allows a school to give, that's the maximum, but it doesn't mean the school is actually getting that number of scholarships for that sport. My college roommate also coached women's basketball, coincidentally, and he was at a Division III school, then a Division II school, and then he was at Sacramento State for many years. And when he was at a Division II school, it was in West Virginia, he got two scholarships to divide up for all of his athletes. Two. I was at a Division II school as a head coach at the same time in Michigan. I had a fully funded 10 scholarships to divide up. Okay, so you can see the difference there. So one thing you might want to write down is find out if the school is fully funded because this directly relates to how much money they have. And you can ask the coach, and the coach is probably going to say, well, we're, we're top three in the league. <laughs> you can't say something like that. So you're going to have to maybe find out on your own, but the coach may tell you if you get, if you get to talk to one of the assistant or head coaches. Uh, so we'll come back to some other things on Division One later. Division Two. Uh, yes, question. Do you have any more of these flyers? Uh, I think I do. I think they're around. Yeah, they're around. Around. I mean, I just want to go make copies of it, and then we'll be handing them out. Okay, thank you. And uh, Division Two, Division Two is a little bit different. I explained one difference there, but also the the number of schools. There's there's more Division Two schools than Division One. There's about 350 D one. There's upwards of 450 D two. Okay, so there's a lot more, and they tend to be more medium size or smaller. But there are some very large D twos as well. Okay. So it's not always D1 or the largest. One of the schools I looked or I worked at was Evansville. Anybody know the uh, the mascot at the University of Evansville? They're Division One. It's a small private school, about 2,000 students. The Purple Aces, the Purple Aces, and, and so this is an example of a of a D1 that's small. But a lot of schools that are that size, Evansville, they tend to be D2 or even D3. Okay, so it's not necessarily always the case that their large schools are D1. It's not necessarily the case that small schools are D3 or D2. Okay, and then D3, uh, big difference there, and I think most of you know this, no athletic scholarships at Division III schools. However, that is definitely a misnomer. Does anybody know why? Anybody? Anybody? Take a guess. It's because most of these D3s, a lot of them, will offer the maximum merit to that athlete that they want to bring in. And that, that athlete may not get maximum merit if they weren't an athlete, a recruited athlete. Now are they supposed to do that? No. Is there anyone watching out for that? Not really. Okay? Does it go on? Absolutely. I had a good friend of mine, he's coaching at Moorhead State uh, Women's Basketball. His name's Greg Todd, and Greg used to be at Transylvania, a small private school in Lexington, Kentucky. Really good school. And they would not do what I just said. They would not give the athletes a dime more than what uh, any other student 
guy who is not an athlete, okay? But I've seen it. I've worked with a lot of clients, and I've seen it. I'm just telling you. Here's one for you. There's a Newbury Park kid from last year. He's a goalie. He's playing Division II soccer this year at Concordia Irvine. He was offered at a D3 school. He had a good GPA and had a good test score, but he was offered this massive scholarship. He's only got to pay like 12 grand a year there, 65,000 to go there. It's crazy. It's D3, so it's all academic, right? You're going to find that they get leadership scholarships. Another Newbury Park kid, lefty pitcher. He's pitching at Webster. It's a small private school in Missouri. In uh, St. Louis, same thing. He was negotiating, he was looking at this school, looking at that school. He talked to his mom, it's like, hey, tell the, tell the school he's got a sibling, he's got two going to college, money is a factor, and then stop talking. Mom liked to talk too much, just stop talking. <laughs> and she did that, and I said, they're gonna come up with a leadership scholarship, I guarantee it. And they're not gonna call it that, but they're gonna come up, what do you know? Hey, Scott should apply for this leadership. He called it the exact same thing, leadership scholarship. And it's 2,000 renewable for four years. He's got eight grand. That's not much, but is it? I mean, it's eight grand, right? Just for asking. So Division three again, the big difference, no athletic money. They tend to be smaller schools. There's like 600 of them. There's a lot of Division threes. okay? Okay, uh, moving on here. A verbal offer versus a written offer. So a verbal offer, terrible slide, sorry. Verbal, I've used this thing many times, I've never had it, I never had that my words disappear, I apologize. So the verbal offer is just that, where it can be made and extended, you see it, you hear about it all the time. How many of your children have had a verbal offer, anybody? A few, yes. So verbal offers at any level can be extended at any time. Well, technically, they're not supposed to do it until a certain age, depending on the sport, but it absolutely goes on through the high school coach, through the club coach, or through others, okay? So verbal offers happen technically at any age, okay? The verbal offer is between the coach and the athlete. It's not between the school and the athlete. So when the coach takes another job, gets a better job and moves on, or gets fired and moves on, does that verbal offer stand? The answer is maybe. If the new coach coming in wants to keep that student athlete as a verbal offer, as a, as a scholarship offer, then they can do that. Or they can just say, I'm sorry, no verbal offer. When a written offer comes into play for Division I, Division II, when there's a scholarship involved, it's called an NLI, it's an actual National Letter of Intent, it's actually a, a, a contract, and you're, you're bound to that school. So if you sign an NLI, the coach leaves, that NLI is between the athlete and the school, so you're, you're there. You can choose to leave if the coach leaves, but very different, written offer versus verbal offer. How many verbal offers get rescinded by the coach? Does that ever happen? So they extend an offer to you, and then a year later they think, eh, you're not a kid, we thought you were, this kid's better, and they wanna come here, I'm sorry, we're not gonna, we're taking back off. It does happen, but rarely. Okay, verbal offers rarely get rescinded. Does the player, say, hey, I changed my mind. I, I know I'm verbally committed, but I just got off by Syracuse, I'm out of here. That does happen a little more often, but not as often as you think. But it does happen more often than the coach pulling in. Okay, so verbal offer, written offer, any questions on those? And I should have asked, asked the questions earlier. If you ever have questions, please raise your hand. Um, all right, so first steps. Determine level of play. I was just talking to someone, the parents here before we started. This is one of the big things. If you're Son or daughter is one of the better players in the high school team, or the best player, and they're one of the better players on the club team. And you think it's a lock. My kid's gonna play college, fill in the blank. It's not so. They are not a recruitable athlete until they get recruited. And the first thing you wanna do is figure out what level of play is my son or daughter, and how do you do that? It's not from your high school coach. I was a high school coach. And if I tried to make those predictions, I, I was, Semi right, and your kids' coaches are going to be semi right. It's not the club coach either. They don't determine the level of play. I've got a I've got a soccer player I'm working with from Westlake High School, and she's uh, pretty young. She's just well, she just started her junior year, and she's uh, not had any offers yet. But her club coach, who is a Division One coach, said you're D one. Okay, why isn't she having offers yet? Okay? You're not D1 
I mean, he has he has a vested interest there because he's the kid is playing for him on his club, and those clubs are a money making venture. Don't get fooled. It is a money making venture. Answer me that question. Why does she have no offers? Her club coach claims, who is a Division I college coach, claims that she is D1. Again, I will say, you are not D1 until you are recruited D1, or D2, or D3, okay? So the next question then is, uh, how do you get the determination made? So you can get the determination made by talking to coaches. You've gotta get film, 100%. And I haven't seen a sport where this doesn't count. Get film, get quality film. You could do it yourself and save a lot of money. You could pay somebody to do it. Get film. There's all kinds of apps where you can break it down. The film then needs to be sent out. You need to get going with this at any age. Start to send, I shouldn't say that, that's not true. Once they've reached the varsity level, if there's a varsity JV breakdown, if it's swimming and it's times, you know the times are competitive, or it's track and field, and you know the, the jumps are competitive, or the time then absolutely it's time, okay? But if they're playing JV, that's not the time. College coaches do not want to see JV film. They do not have time. Of the college coach I had back, this is way back in the day, we had, it was the crossover between VHS and DVDs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the end, of, when I was done, it was all digital, okay? But when I was first starting, we have piles, piles of DVDs on the desk to, to look at. You think they're gonna watch any JV film? Absolutely not. No coach in America, I can, I can I stand firm on that opinion. It's probably a fact, okay? They're not gonna look at JV film. It's varsity level competition. Now, what varsity level competition, let's say your son or daughter is legit, they're pretty good, they're one of the best players on the team, they play club, they're pretty good. What makes them stand out, or how do I find out, okay? It's film against good competition. Think about it. If you were the college coach, do you want to watch some kid just dominate on some crappy team? Against a crappy team, I'm saying. No. You want to see the kid against other college level players. Which is why club sports, unfortunately, are very necessary. Okay? And I say unfortunate, I know I've got a lot of club people in here probably. How many of you have a kid who's in club sports? non scholastic Almost everybody. I say necessary evil because, what well, you already heard me, the coaches, it's a money-making venture, okay? And they're many times in it to put the kid at the highest level that they can get him at so they can say, I got another D1 kid. That's not the best case. Why are there 8,000 kids in the transfer portal? Do you know what the transfer portal is? Raise your hand if you know what it is. Not very many. So the transfer portal came out a few years ago, the NCAA, in all of its greatness, and it's, it's just it's such a wise institution. They, thank you, thank you. It's unbelievable how incompetent they are. They decided that you don't have to sit out when you transfer, and you can just put your name in this portal, and then coaches can go shop, D1, D2, D3 coaches can go shop on the portal, see the film of college level, against college level. Who do you think they're taking first? Taking those kids. It's musical chairs, I was talking to a parent earlier tonight, it's musical chairs, and all the college players who are leaving a school and going to another school, 8,000 of them, they're in the portal right now, okay? That's, a, that's just an insane number, okay? And they get to sit down first, and then the high school kids. Now, if your high school kid is legit blue chipper, like they're gonna come in and start, obviously they're gonna get an offer, they're gonna, they're gonna get a scholarship before some of these transfers actually happen. But do you understand the concept of the portal and how it's affected high school athletes? So, when it comes down to, I have an offer from this school, it used to be, well, let's look at what time this is, it's junior year, okay, or, and let's, let's see what else is out there if it's not your dream school. No, not more. It's like if you like this school and it fits you and you've got a great offer, there's no reason for you not to take it, why are you going to play the field? Because that offer is going to be gone. Because there's going to be another transfer, actually 10 more transfers coming in that portal the next day. You understand? Okay, and again, this isn't my opinion, this is all fact. I keep, I keep in touch with a lot of coaches. I was having lunch about uh, three weeks ago with Coach Todd, the guy I mentioned earlier I coached with in Moorhead State. I was at, uh, had to go back to Kentucky for a family and I got to sit down and eat lunch with him. It was wonderful. And we were talking the entire time about the transfer portal. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. Well, actually, that's not true. Transfer portal and this name and likeness. Raise your hand if you heard of name and likeness. It's cash. 
for the players. Cash. It's crazy. There's no rules. Well, there's rules, but nobody follows them. There's no one checking. Um, okay, so after you determine what level of play, again, who determines the level of play? The college coaches. Okay? And there's tricks to that, but it's contact, it's, it's communication. What is the right fit? So, again, back to my criticism. Now, and I've been, a, I've been a club coach, by the way. Not all club coaches are the same. So I don't mean to, don't mean to say earlier that all club coaches necessary, evil, whatever. It, there's a lot of great people in club sports. A lot. Okay? My daughter played some club lacrosse for this team called United. And the guy that ran that was phenomenal. He was great. It was just this summer for a few tournaments. It was great. There's some really good people in club sports. Okay? So, the club coaches are going to many times push you to the highest level, and I said that earlier, is that what's important? Let's look at why there are 8,000 kids in the transfer portal. Obviously, they're not happy. What do you think the biggest reason is why they transfer? Playing time. Playing time. There used to be the kid. They're used to playing the whole game, right? And then they go sit on the bench. I mean, it is devastating. They think of themselves, and you guys are athletes, you think of yourself as an athlete. I hope you do, right? I identify as an athlete, if I'm an athlete. And then you're gonna go sit the bench after you've been a premier player on your teams? It's really hard. So when I say, what is the right fit? You've gotta really think about this. What is important to you? And you really gotta think about this. You really gotta soul search over the course of many weeks. Do not do it in a day. I want to play for the highest level. <laughs> 8,000 <laughs> are playing at the wrong level. So I got to go back to Toledo, Ohio. One of the uh, logos he's up there was the Rockets. The Toledo Rockets. I coached them for four years. It was wonderful. I was talking to uh, Carmela and Roberto outside about the uh, one experience we had with, a, with an Orthodox Jewish kid that played with us. She was from Israel. It's just incredible four years coaching. Nama! Shafir! It's unbelievable. Okay? <laughs> Toledo, Ohio. The Rockets and the the things that the things that were taught by my boss there are the things that I'm using when I'm talking to you and I'm talking to student athletes and parents about fit, okay? Because what she was sure of, she did not want kids to come in and be unhappy, and so she only recruited players that she knew weren't going to play for a year or two who knew that. She talked to him about it ahead of time. She's like, you're probably not going to play, Riley. Riley was an incredible, incredible woman. And she, at the time, high school kid. Now she's a woman. I got to go back a year ago in February. We won the national championship for the WNIT, and they brought all these women back from the team. Everybody but Nama. And I got to talk to Riley. I hadn't seen her in 10 years. It was great. And Riley was one of these kids. She knew she wasn't going to play. She rarely played. But when she got in, she was a shooter, and she shot the ball, the crowd went nuts. We had 5,000 fans every game, and they went crazy. She was a crowd favorite. She knew she wasn't going to play because the boss said that. That's a rare thing. Most of the time, the coaches are telling you, oh, you can come in and play, you know? You can come in and play. You, and they, you could. That's, a, that's the key word there, could. Okay, do you want to come in and set the bench? I think I made my point, right? You've got to think about it. Is it the right school academically? They have my major. What does that mean? When I work with students that aren't athletes for college planning, college counseling, call whatever you want, that's what we spend a lot of time on. It's not just, oh, they have a chemistry program. Okay, do they have an internship program so that you can go your sophomore and junior and senior year and do an internship program using that chemistry knowledge and building your resume and seeing what type of job you actually want to do? These are things that student athletes miss out on because they go for what? the highest level of play. It's not always the best thing, okay? There's a lot more to it that athletes leave out. And if I were you, I would not let your son or daughter determine where they're gonna go to school by, that's, I got an offer from a Big 12 school, I'm going, okay? If the Big 12 school has everything else you need, or which Big 12 school? I'm not saying don't go to the highest level, I'm saying go to a school that matches you, what if you don't play all four years? You don't want to transfer. You want to be happy there. You want to thrive there, even without athletics. Okay? So there's a lot to it with what is the right fit. 
Athletic separators. So we talked about separators with academics. So I had a student last year, and he was a music major, trombone player, and he's very competitive. He's up near San Francisco. He's very, very competitive. And he ended up at Brown, Ivy League, playing. He's major in music, okay? Major in music. He wants to go to med school. It's kind of a funny story. Why would he major in music? Anybody know? Exactly, exactly. He's going to have one step up on all those biology majors, okay? He is, and he's going to get A's in music. His separator was his music, and he was applying to music schools that were competitive, able to try out and everything, right, all these schools. But his separator was all the different music things. Your separator, you know, when we're talking, not talking sports, is just the fact that, so let's say your son or daughter isn't gonna go play college sports, but they're still involved at the level they're in. That's a separator. That separates them from a lot of other applicants. But what about athletic separators? What separates your kid from all the other point guards? All the other wing eyes? What separates your kid athletically? Are they the kid, and this is important, so write this down. Are they the kid that's helping somebody up? Are they the kid that's looking at the coach when they're talking to him? Are they the kid that is on their phone or not on their phone, okay? And, and do you think the college coaches are talking to those coaches, club and high school, about all these other things off the court? Absolutely. At Toledo, first year we were there. I was there with, with Coach Cullop. We came from Evansville, like I said, first year. We needed this shooter from Northern Indiana. Indiana's basketball mecca, right? Everybody's heard of Hoosiers, right? Indiana, basketball's crazy in that state. This kid was the second leading three-point shooter in the state. Call her coach. She's coming on an official visit in a week and we're gonna offer her. Called the coach, talked to the coach. I'm new, you probably, not call, you probably wanna call the other coach though. He coached her last year. Here's his number, call the other coach. He goes, well, I don't wanna talk to you too much here, but you need to call the office and talk to the counselor. All right, talk to the counselor. Counselor says, what's your fax number? my fax number. All right, I gotta go. Let me know if you have questions. Get the fax. It's two pages, rap sheet. This kid is a hoodlum, right? Next call was to her. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to cancel the visit. That's a true story, okay? This kid was gonna get a full ride offer. We canceled the visit because she was tardy in fights, cussing, just all kinds of bad things getting written up, right? Now, was the counselor supposed to fax us that, that document? Probably not. But, uh, <laughs> and it, it, it's proof that it happens, folks. So you have to have separators and that you've got to be an outstanding citizen. That's the easiest separator. Okay? What if you talk better than every other kid they're recruiting? Talk on the field. That's a separator. Okay? Those are really, really important things. So figure out your separator, your athletic separator. Do this, improve visibility. I talked about um, you know, getting the word out through film, right? There's other ways of visibility. Someone asked me earlier, NCSA, there's lots of different websites out there that will charge you a lot of money, but there's also free ones. And when I say charge you a lot of money, I mean you need it somewhere where the coaches can get the film easily. A lot of my clients use NCSA in the free version, so they have a site, there's the video, the coaches can click on it, we send them to the site, hey, go, here's my, here's my NCSA, boom. Other times we just don't even use that, we use other, other ones that are out there that are free, and then we also just, we do a lot of just sending of a YouTube link, of a YouTube channel, and we just update it, update the channel, send that link out, we send it out every couple weeks, okay? And, and so that's the best way to do it, I think. I'm a little frugal and I don't like wasting money. I sat through the NCS, NCSA speech with my daughter for the cross. I wanted to hear what they had to say. They're kind of my competition in a little, little bit. There's a little overlap there. And, and I wanted to hear what they had to say. And so it's, it's not a bad service if, you, if, you don't, if you've got extra money. Because if you pay extra, then they're going to do more for you with connecting you to colleges. Okay? However, you need to understand this. Division I colleges typically are not recruiting from NCSA, from emails. Hey, look at this point guard, look at this point guard. Because they have full ride scholarships. They don't need to do that. D2, the high academic D2s, will use those sites. Okay, because they need high academic kids with good test scores. 
D3s will absolutely use it. So if your kid is a D3, you might think about NCSA at one of those lower paid levels just so you get that added feature, okay? So I'm not saying that they're not, um, that like stay away from them, but just make sure you look into it and count your dollars, okay? Because it is, it is, it does get pricey and you don't have to spend that money there. Um, Playing club sports, I already mentioned that. A lot of you said they're in club sports. So you've got to get visibility outside of high school. If you think your kid's going to get recruited uh, regionally or nationally, so six hours away or all the way across the country, regionally or nationally, so not locally, if you think you're going to get recruited from high school sports, it's tough. It's tough. Will a college coach come to a high school game? Yes. Are they coming there to make an evaluation, or are they coming there because they already know they want the kid and they're showing them attention? Which one? I promise you it's the latter. It's the latter. They're not coming there to evaluate. They do that in club, they do that in a film. They don't have time to drive six hours, four hours, two hours even. They are so busy, trust me. Okay, if they show up at your game, that's a really good sign. That's a really good sign, okay? Um, ask college coaches questions. Okay, so what could you ask the college coach? Let's hear some uh, let's hear some options here. We've got what sport, ladies? Soccer? Soccer? Volleyball. Volleyball. All right. Have you talked to a college coach before? I'm putting you on the spot. I'm uh, sorry. No. No? We're both freshmen. Both freshmen, okay. So you got some got some time there. They can't really talk to you legally, right? Um, you can call them. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. You can call coaches. They can talk to you if you call them. Okay? They can't call you. There's a whole bunch of rules. The NCAA has rules for the coaches. You have to pass a test every year if you're a Division I coach before you can go out recruiting. If you don't pass it, you don't get to go out recruiting. You have to wait a month. I pass it every year. Got them all right most of the time, but I had friends of mine that didn't pass it, and they didn't go out recruiting for a month. It's crazy. Okay, so the rules, the NCAA is nuts. The book is this thick. They have rules about rules, and then they have rules about those rules that are about rules. Okay? So there's lots of different things. And they change for each sport, sometimes every year. So the QR codes, can I see that sheet please? Thank you. I'll right back to you. So the QR codes here that pertain to rules. The NCAA Eligibility Center is excellent. So at some point you need to register, if you think you're D2 or D1 in NCAA, you need to register with the NCAA. It takes about a half hour, costs you like, I don't know, 60 bucks or something. 75. 75. <laughs> Inflation, what do you know? NCAA student athletes, if you click there, you're gonna get some another bit that's really good information. Um, the transfer portal I mentioned earlier is right there. NAIA Eligibility Center, um, the recruiting calendar, there we go, that's what I was looking for. On the right side, bottom item, NCAA recruiting calendar. That one's really good because it tells you uh, when they can, con so there's, there's per periods. The coaches have periods. Recruiting, they have an evaluation period where they can evaluate you in person. They have a dead period, they can't do anything with you, okay? On campus, they can't do anything with you on campus. They can actually still take a call, and I think they can make a call in most sports. Um, evaluation period, dead period, they have quiet periods where they can't be off campus, okay? But they can talk to you, they can write you, okay? Every sport is different. Women's basketball has a lot of rules, the sport I coach, okay? Other sports don't have as many rules. Baseball last year just passed a rule where you can't talk to the kid so early anymore because these baseball coaches were they're crazy with talking to these kids in their ninth grade, okay? So that doesn't happen, as far as I know, it doesn't happen in any sport anymore that the coaches can reach out to ninth or 10th graders. Usually it's June 15th of your junior year. That's usually what it is, don't quote me on that. It depends on your sport, okay? Any, those dates are in here though. You look under it's still a pretty calendar. Conference maps, that's just off Wikipedia, but this is really interesting. How far away do you want to travel for your games when you're a college athlete? Do you think it's fun to get into an airplane and fly across the country? The Big Ten is nuts. I grew up in Michigan, the Big Ten is right there. Now we got Rutgers, we got Nebraska, we just added some West Coast teams to the Big Ten, didn't we? Right? Which teams? I can't remember. UCLA is going Big Ten? Yeah. 
USC. Unbelievable. 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 The Big Ten is that. Do you want to get into a plane? Okay, is it a is it commercial or is it charter, coach? It's not a bad question to ask, actually. So I'll get to some more questions here in a second. But do you want to fly all the way across the country? So this um, this conference map, it just tells you the conference for D3, D2, D1, and it gives you a footprint on how far away you're going to be traveling. Most of your games are conference games. You will play some games that are non-conference. And usually you travel sometimes for those. Sometimes they're right in your backyard. Okay? So think about that. How much time do you want to spend during the semester on an airplane? Okay, some of the colleges I work for, we bust everywhere. That's very, very common, D3 and D2. I was at Hillsdale College in Michigan. For those, those of you who don't know, Michigan is shaped like this. And this, there's two peninsulas. And Hillsdale is here, Michigan Tech is here. This is water, it was unbelievable. You had to drive six hours to get to the Mackinac Bridge <coughs> connecting the two peninsulas. And then another six hours through the Coniferous Forest to get to Michigan Tech in Houghton. It was crazy. They closed the bridge on the way home. How does a bridge close? It's one of the world's largest suspension bridges and the wind blows and it's, they're afraid the bus is gonna just go over, so yeah. So you either sit there at the bridge for five hours, turning a 12 hour trip into a 17 hour trip, or you drive through Chicago down through Wisconsin and get home. I'm telling you these stories for a reason. Do you wanna do that? Or, do you like a better conference, or do you like a conference or a team that has enough money where you're flying, and then if you're flying commercially, you're, guess what? Connection, connection, cancel, awful, okay? Or are you flying a charter, right? Are you in a charter plane? We got to do that a few times when I was at Fleet, though. Not very often. I, had to, I was in charge of getting those planes. It's about 30, well, back then, a long time ago, it was 35 grand for a charter plane one way, okay? So those colleges that fly on a charter everywhere they go over six hours, they're spending some serious money, okay? Why do I tell you that? Because when you're going through the recruiting process, it is okay to ask that question. Hey coach, tell me how you guys travel. And then don't talk, and let's see what, they, see what the coach has to say, okay? You don't want to get into, are you chartering or not, coach? You don't need to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Just say, coach, like, what kind of hotels you guys stay in this year? You know, coach, uh, whatever, name your favorite restaurants. My favorite restaurant, do we ever eat there? I mean, find these things out. Okay, when you're, when, you're, when you're a recruit and they are recruiting you and you have options, they are going to put you in, on the phone with players. If they know what they're doing anyway. We always did. When a player was in our office, hey, talk to Sally here. Hello, no, 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 whatever. And ask the player, hey, so tell me about travel. And then what you want to do, write this down, you want to see if the answers are the same. <laughs> and you want to see if the answers are the same when you're talking to the assistant coach, which is who you're going to talk to most of the time, and then when you get on the phone with the head coach. Ask three questions of all the coaches. If you don't have a journal, get a journal. The, the, the two ladies right here, you guys prefer phones, or do you do, I think I, I thought I had a, yeah, or, or do you, would, you, would you actually use a journal? I just saw a girl, what's your name in the class, what's your name? Yeah, what's your name? Samantha. Samantha, Samantha that was priceless. Thank you. No, I use a journal. You do? I do. I have it in my bag. Awesome. Because I read your face as like, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is good because you can, you can I, I, I use this obviously not for recruiting, but I put notes in here for conversations I have. So it's the same concept. Why do you want notes? Because when you talk to the head coach, you're taking notes as you're talking. Use the, use the earbuds put on speaker, whatever, and write, okay? Talking to the players, same thing. Take notes. If you get recruited and you've got 10 co colleges recruiting you, do you know how many coaches you're gonna be talking to? 30, because they all have assistants. You need to take notes. And the conversations don't have to be an hour. Talk to them for seven minutes. Coach, I got calculus, I'm sorry. Hey, can we talk in a couple weeks? I'd love to check in, I really enjoyed this. Even if, you, even if the coach was drafted, you didn't even want, you didn't even want to talk to him. Any recruiting is good recruiting. Any recruiting is good recruiting because it snowballs because they're going to ask you what question when you're talking to them. Who else you like? Who else are you looking at? Who else are you talking to? They're going to ask you that. And if you say, "Well, I've been talking to a few coaches in the Midwest, coach over here, you know, two two local coaches," and you can answer it like that. You don't have to actually name a school, 
Okay? But you never lie. So any recruiting is great recruiting. Everybody got it? I mean, that is a huge, huge, huge benefit. Once it starts, it snowballs. Okay? All right. You can ask coaches. This is important, so I'm going to keep going here on this. You can ask coaches. Uh, so, Coach, how long have you been there? You should have already looked it up, by the way. Before you have a conversation with the coach, look them up. Read their biography. Read it. It's on the website. I guarantee it. Read what kind of season they had last year. Okay? If you want to continue to be recruited, carry on a, a, a conversation where you're in the know. Okay? Even though you know that the coach has been there for the last 12 years, Coach, how long have you been there? Well, I've been here, I, you know, I don't even know, maybe 10, 12 years? Oh, well, you must like it. And then again, stop talking. It's a great question. It's not really a question. You must like it. It's an open-ended statement, right? And then they're going to say, oh, I love it. And they're going to go into all these great things about the school and the community, right? And then you can interject with, oh, that's pretty cool. My little brother plays hockey, too, when he's telling you about his son or daughter that plays hockey. <coughs> yep, they've got girls hockey. I got a uh, client of mine from New Jersey. She plays hockey. Not going to be at the college board. Um, ask yourself. I can't believe these slides. I'm so sorry. It's mm -hmm. embarrassing. I don't understand this. I've done this so many times, and I can't even see my own slides. Ask yourself questions. So I already covered the biggest one. That is, what <coughs> level do I? Why do I want to go to what level? Basically, what what are what's important to me in a school? And it better be not just the sport. Okay. So I kind of covered this one. I'm going to keep moving here so we get through all these. Um, don't do this, okay? So these are common mistakes. Being unrealistic. I talked to a player in the Caneo Valley in a certain sport. <laughs> Completely unrealistic. Completely unrealistic, okay? You have to realize, and I stressed it earlier, you don't determine, your coach doesn't determine what level of play the college coaches do. Assuming schools know you. They don't. Until they contact you, they don't know you, at least as far as you know. Could you be on one of their list? Yes, you probably are. But does that mean they really know who you are? Okay? So it's until they contact you, they're allowed to send you a questionnaire when you're young, by the way, ninth grade. Anybody got a questionnaire? Did ladies get a questionnaire yet? No? You will. You will. What, um, and, I, and you could be on the freshman team, you could be on the varsity team, doesn't really matter. Okay? They can still send you questionnaires, so go to camps, ladies. Go to camps. Have you been in camps? No, I went to the UCLA. Like nice, nice, nice. Yeah. With soccer, you know, they have those ID prospect camps all over the place. So here's a really good and really important money saver. Figure out if it's a money grab or if they're actually recruiting you. Okay? Because you're going to spend 200 here, 300 here all month long, month after month after month, one of these ID camps, and really, they're not even looking at you, okay? If you know you're at that level, then it makes sense to go through the ID camp. But if you don't know you're at that level, and, and if, but if it's your first one, you haven't been into camps, you guys are young, you went to one ID camp, I would go to more just to let them tell you what level you're at. There's not supposed to be any recruiting at camps anymore. I got out of coaching, and we could still recruit at camps. They were just changing the rules, okay? And so I don't have any evidence that recruiting goes on at the camps, but you gotta be kidding me if you think there's not <laughs> recruiting going on at the camps, okay? So um, it's a really good way of finding out kind of what level, just talk to them say, and say, hey, I'm gonna call you on my way home. I'm gonna call you tomorrow at four o'clock. And the coach is gonna go, okay. And then you can have that conversation. You saw me play. I was at your ID camp. I paid you $150. Now what <laughs> level am I at? Ask the coach. This is what I do all the time with my clients. I'll send out video to coaches and I'll say, hey coach, I used to coach D1, D2. I know your time is precious, recruiting process. Just tell me what level you think this kid's at. I do that all the time. And, and I get a lot back, more than you think anyway. Not a super high percentage, but I get a lot back. I had a lacrosse player from Rondondo. They were playing you guys last year. I went to the game, Oak Park, I think. And uh, he, was, uh, he went on a visit to a small private in uh, Michigan, Hope College. Okay, and that conversation was because of that question. So he went on a visit. He didn't like the weather. He didn't like how you know, it's 
It's a beautiful area, but it's just not the right place for him. So the coach emails me back, hey, send me some film. He's definitely at our level. And so he got the recruiting going that way because of that question, okay? And yeah, it's a little bit different. It's coming from a, a former coach, but I think you still could have some success. Um, too short of a list. Yeah, this happens with uh, non-athletes as well. So make sure you have plenty of schools. And then you can narrow it down. You can always narrow it down. It's part of the pro uh, procrastination and relying on others. So the kids need to do a lot of this themselves. And if they aren't doing it themselves, if the dad's doing it, the mom's doing it, the coach, the high school, the kids have got to do it. They've got to do the work. Let them edit the film. Let them send the emails. They do the work, not the parents. Okay, NCAA rules, I kind of already talked about this earlier. Talked about the calendar, talked about the transfer portal. Awesome. What questions do you have? Pretty What's your name, I'm sorry? Preeti. Preeti. Yeah, my son is freshman in baseball. Very good. So, despite my daughter, where do we get these camps? Are you done? Okay, so if you do some Google searching, you'll be able to find a ton of them. Mm -hmm. Type in baseball prospect camps. That's a good way. I was just I just did this a few weeks ago. I picked up a baseball player from down in actually he's another Rondondo kid, and uh, he's a baseball player. And literally, he signed up and then he got injured right away. He signed up with me and then he got injured right away. So now he's healthy again, and I'm going to get back on there and do more because they are literally all over the place, all over the country, locally here too. I mean, down to LA. Right, and they happen all the time. But again, most of them are money grabs. Okay, so you gotta kinda figure it out. If your son or daughter is high academic, and that's a relative term, depending on the college, go to the high academic events. Baseball has high academic events. The lefty pitcher from Newray Park, his parents don't care, I'll say his name, Scott Devall, he's, he's Scotty, he's the one that I mentioned earlier in, in that Webster, and, Missouri, he got recruited from a, a high academic camp, and I think it was in LA, he went to a few all around regionally, but, and so it, it's a really good, you know, he's a good student, yeah. okay? And I'll say this also about high academics. When I was coaching at Hillsdale, the average SAT, ACT was a uh, 30, and so they really, like, I couldn't recruit an NCAA eligible kid, just because they're eligible. Do you have to have certain grades, test, well, they don't have to have test score anymore, but grades, and at the time, you had to have test scores. And so I had 10 full scholarships I told you about. Well, I had 15 full scholarship players. How did I do that with 10 scholarships? Division two, because you can stack the money. I only recruited kids that were in the money with merit aid. So at Hillsdale, and the, every college does this, merit scholarships kick in at certain levels. I should say every. Most colleges do, do this. So at Hillsdale was a 28. You got a 28, you got a quarter of your tuition all four years, that's your minimum scholarship. If you got a 29, it bumped up to a third. A 30 went to half and so forth. So I didn't recruit kids that weren't a 32. They were getting three quarters tuition, so I could stretch 10 scholarships to 15. First year there, when I came in, the previous coach, I don't know what she was thinking, there was 18 players, okay? 18 players, it's crazy. And so it's, it's one of those things where if you're academically inclined, you have a good test score and or a good GPA, it makes you more recruitable for D3 and for D2 and for D1 non-head count because they can give you a scholarship offer that includes academic money and athletic money. Okay? So it really helps. So you don't have to take the SAT or the ACT. Great question. California. Great question. So Yes and no, so I'll give you a, a, several answers. The UCs and the Cal States, for the time being, have said no more tests. Like, blind, they don't even want them. Um, you can't, supposedly you can't put them on the application. However, after you apply to the portal, what do you know? You still have, there it is. Here's your test score, put it in. Oh, we're only using that to see what classes you're gonna be in. BS. If you think college admissions don't lie, you're crazy, okay? The test is very helpful. Test optional is, is what a lot of schools are still at, but a lot of those are going next year to requiring the test. Certain states require it for every state school. Every state school in Florida, every state school in Georgia, you have to turn in a test. There are many schools where the test, if you turn in a test, your merit scholarships at a different level. At the University of Kentucky, 
This is not athletic, this is just anybody. So non headcount sports, because they're D1, or just all the normal student athletes. And this was last year, so don't quote me on it for this year, because I don't have anybody applying to Kentucky this year. Actually, I do. I, I'm not sure on this year, but last year, if you had a 25 on the ACT or an equivalent SAT, you can take either test, doesn't matter. If you had a 25 or equivalent SAT, then you needed a 3.5 to get the maximum merit scholarship. I think it was 12 grand out of state, 12 grand a year. Don't quote me on that number, I think it's close. And then if you didn't turn in a test score, you needed a 3.8, these are unweighted GPA, to get the same scholarship. Okay, so when people in California tell you, because the UCs and the Cal States, it's not required, they say, oh, the test is gone, everybody's optional. It's not the case, it might be the case. It might be the case. Okay, I have a student I'm working with, she was in Ventura, she moved to Virginia. 4.0, 4.6. But her test score isn't even close to that. She's not turning that test score in anyway. Okay, because she's gonna get maximum merit if a school is optional. And, Fortunately, all the schools for her major, they're, they're all either test blind or test optional. Okay, so you can get away without taking the test. The NCAA no longer requires it. That's big, they just dropped it. No more testing for the NCAA, okay? They use GPA. They have a sliding scale, I didn't cover this. By and large, all your student athletes are gonna be eligible for the NCAA because it's a very low threshold. They take your GPA for the core classes only. It's a little bit different from D2 to D1. And they, they give it a GPA for just those 16 classes. And you have to have 10 of them in, 10 of the 16, before your junior year starts. Okay, you, they added that one a few years ago. Okay, because you can replace, you can replace for that GPA, you can use whatever, like it says, you need three math. Okay, well, if you've got a D in math one, you're gonna take an extra math class, you no longer have to use the D. See what I'm saying? Well now, you have to have so many of those classes from your junior and senior year. Does that make sense? Yeah? Can your counselors um, weigh you out for you, like, on, on, in terms of, like, uh, you want to be D3, and they look at your courses over, or your students' courses over a particular period of time, and then weigh it in the same way that you're talking about to know if they've completed or done or met? Yes, the, so are you, I think you're asking if the high school uh, guidance counselor can figure your GPA so that you meet the NCAA guidelines. And the answer is, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Some can, some don't, probably don't know how to do it. Um, just send me an email and I'll do it for you. I have, a, I have it in spreadsheets. Put in the classes, there's your GPA. And actually, I need to check the rule to make sure on that. But here we go. It's not super complicated once you look at that because you're just picking out the classes, you know, X number of math, X number of English. Does it break it up between D1, D2, and D3? Uh, it's slightly different for D1 and D2. D3 has none for NCAA because the schools have their own policies that are much higher, right? At mo most D3s are high academic schools, or I shouldn't say that, they're, so they're stronger. D1 and D2, Yes, yes, it, it, it's strictly, it, it's strictly, if you hit that number, you're good. So in most D1s, except for, you know, Stanford, and, and it's true even at a school like Stanford, at most D1s, I was at Stony Brook, it's a good academic school, really hard to get in. It's like, like Hillsdale, it's like a 30 ACT average, okay? Any kid that passed the NCAA eligibility was in. All we did was turn in a list, they're in. There was no question. And that's how almost every D1 is in the country, and D2 for that matter, except for some of these top 20, top 30 schools, like Ivy Leagues, Northwest, well, Northwestern, I mean, one of the assistant coaches at Stanford for women's basketball, um, a few years back, she no longer there, she was at Michigan State before that, and I was at Toledo, we did scheduling together, and we were always trying to get a game, and I knew her from recruiting, and I called her when I moved out here, and I said, what can you guys get in? She said, 25. A 25? You get a 25 ACT in the Stanford? She goes, yeah. 
but only one, and we better have like 333 ACTs with it in that class. So it does happen. It does happen that the athletes get in at a lower, a lower, easier score. Uh, more questions? Yes. That's a great question, and I'm going to give you, this is strictly my opinion here, but it's based on 30 years of watching this, and I'm telling you this is 100%, I strongly, strongly believe what I'm about to say, and that is make sure he stays in both sports for as long as he can, okay, for as long as he can, and I can tell you why. The club coach is going to tell him, no, you got to go, you got you to just do this, okay, don't listen to him. Play that club sport and, and give that that one sport, whichever one is, more, more favor at a certain point, okay? It'd be, it'd be unwise to not do that. There are so many injuries and so much burnout. In baseball, we have 12-year-olds getting Tommy John surgery. Are you kidding me? Are you nuts? So the student I mentioned earlier that's at Brownwood Music, his brother is a ninth grader. This is up in Northern California by uh, right near Stanford. And his brother is a phenom baseball player. And his dad's calling me. I'm not working with the kid yet because he's a little bit young, but he's, his dad's calling me and he's asking me about, you know, he wants to just play baseball and his coaches want him to just play baseball. I was like, don't do it. So he went out for football, which was not what the parents wanted. <laughs> football. We're talking about injuries. That's what the parents' big concern was. But he's so athletic. He's also a boxer and he also is an archer. And he's staying with those other sports for as long as he can, through ninth grade, 10th grade, and maybe even more, at least one more. I'm just telling you, okay, I'll just give you another quick story. I was at uh, Lincoln Southeast High School, and then Lincoln East High School as a coach. The athletic director said, they hired me and they said, Todd, just so you know, all our athletes are multi-sport. Do not tell them they're only playing basketball. It's like, no problem, whatever you say, you're the boss. And that's what I did. And I cannot believe, I'm telling you, the volleyball kids could time their jumps better than any of the other basketball players, the softball kids had incredible hand-eye coordination. The soccer kids were my best on-ball defenders because they moved their feet. And I saw it very quickly. And so I made them. When I went to Lincoln East, the other school, I made them stay in another sport. And all of them were two-sport. A lot of them were three-sport. So, yeah, I think it's super important. Now, with the recruiting, which is kind of what you're asking, the recruiting, I, when I was recruiting, I never – looked at it as something negative that they played more than one sport. I had a kid I offered at Hillsdale in basketball. It's the only school I was a head coach at. I was an assistant at D1 at the other one. So I was a head coach. I was calling the shots. I offered this kid. She's from Kentucky. She goes, I'm going to ball for softball. I was like, Sid, I didn't know you played softball. She said, well, I haven't played in two years, but we're going to have a really good team, and I'm going to go. We might go to state. It's like, do it. Go play. She got hurt. It was minor. But they went to the state. What an what a incredible experience for her senior year to go play softball, right? And then she's not playing basketball all those months because she's playing softball. So she comes to us, and she's not burned out. So that's my opinion on it. It's not necessarily fact. Yeah. Coach. I'm going to echo that in that I've talked to hundreds of college coaches in the last 50 years about my different athletes and multiple sports, and I can't remember when it hasn't been at least in the first five questions the college coach asked, what else do they do? They want well-rounded student athletes. Yep, absolutely. So a question, when, you're, when your student is playing or the varsity level that very last year, they're, obviously, they're you know, um, reaching out to college coaches, they're looking for buyout information. I mean, I'm just wondering at what point are, so that's mainly them networking with coaches at colleges and looking for specific trial dates rather than specific schools coming to recruit them. I mean, I, I'm assuming that most of the labor is on the part of the family and the student, right? Yes, and tell me more about the tryouts you're talking about. You're talking about when the like college is tryout? Tri tri I mean, kind of assuming yeah. trying out for the college baseball team. Yeah, they, they will, depending on the size of the school. They'll do some tryouts, they'll do some, some colleges will do some of those things where they bring you on, and some of those camps are actually more of a tryout. And then, and then for transfers, they can try, they can actually bring them in and do a tryout, you know? 
But for high school kids, it depends on the sport, it depends on the sport, and it depends on the, on the age and the, and the calendar, okay? So you're gonna have to look it up in the NCAA manual there about, and I, hopefully that answers your question. Say, say more, because I wasn't quite sure on the tryout. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess my, my, my biggest thing is, is, is trying to figure out what, you know, how you're figuring out where it is that they're going to be looked at or where they're where they going to go. Okay, so it depends on their age, but I think going to, going to a limited number of those camps is a good thing. Going to too many and finding out later on, I'm like, oh, they're all money grab. So going to some camps and trying to find out what level, and then go to colleges the, the, all those camps are tryouts, yeah. okay? But very few are actually trying out. The rest of them there are paying the coaches both, <laughs> literally, right. okay? So it, you really have to be judicious at what level, try to find out what level. And again, that for boy, is it a boy or a girl? Boy. Okay, boys develop later, so it's much harder, right? It's much, much harder. Girls develop so much earlier, that's why they get recruited earlier. You hear about it all the time, that girls get recruited earlier than boys. Oh, uh, sorry, one here and then there. Yeah, we're together. So okay, your question. <laughs> well, our, our daughter is a non-traditional sport. She's a rhythm gymnastic. She's level nine. How she was in junior Olympics. And uh, I know it's not a college sport, but how we will help her and how can we get this? And she has a good grade, she's a good citizen, but like, how do we get into like colleges and stuff? How do you relate like, that sport? You said gymnastics. Rhythmic gymnastics. Oh, rhythmic gymnastics. Yeah. Ooh. Um, <laughs> yeah, wow. So, have you exhausted it, and you're sure there's no schools that have it as a in a show as a college sport? Okay, if it's not an intercollegiate sport, then there is a chance that there are schools that have it as a club sport. Okay, and so I would check into that, or they have it as a. There's a. There, there could be a college with competitive, even if it's not officially a quote club sport, but I just went to a bunch of colleges with my own two kids in, in Colorado, and they had so many different club sports. So they compete against other colleges, but it's not NCAA competition. Yes. Um, Redshirting. Does that happen in before or after the recruiting process? Or is that recommended? Um, I'd say it Probably happens some where they, they know somebody like in football, they know they're gonna bring somebody in red shirt them or some men's basketball does that again because their bodies aren't there yet, right? And they know they're not gonna play. And so the freshman year, so they, they know and they could even tell them that in the recruiting process. But in other sports, it might come out it might come out halfway through the freshman year. Hey, you're not playing. What do you think about red shirt? And the kid's gonna go, Yeah, can I get a master's degree in five years? The coach is going to go, yeah, if the kid knows what, to, what they're doing anyway, right? So you can get a master's degree out of it, right? Or the kid says, no, coach, I really want to stay for, you know, a lot of kids want to stay the extra year. Who doesn't want to stay in college? Come on. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Is your hand up? No? I have a question, but it's more than I heard on the clubs. I don't know if it's the same, but my daughter plays lacrosse and Instagram. Absolutely, they should be, and I, and I didn't cover this, I'm glad you said that, they should 100% be on Instagram and Twitter. A lot of kids don't want to be on Twitter. The coaches are non-stop on Twitter. And if they're not on Twitter, they're on Instagram, okay? But Twitter, get a Twitter account. And I'll, obviously, they're, listen to this, ladies, your accounts need to be like you are doing an international press conference. They have to be clean, does not even describe, like nothing bad on there. Mm -hmm. Nothing bad. Okay. Say again? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's a good point. Judge their handling. Clean handles. Clean handles. And, and by the way, we, this is, I don't know, I've got too many stories, but all of our athletes at Stony Brook, and not all of them, a lot of them, had fake accounts, because we would follow our own athletes mm -hmm. to find out why you're practicing like dog, because you were, at a party, <laughs> get on the line, ladies. <laughs> so yeah, the fake accounts too. Don't have a fake account. I'm saying. What would you say? We've done added and subtracted things from videos. What do you think the perfect amount of time for a video? There's nothing perfect, but the great question. Yeah. It depends on the sport, but I would do a shorter highlight film, 
and then also have some halves or full game against really good competition ready. Coaches request a full game. Right, right. But as soon as to get them interested at the beginning, they see right. how, hey, send me some more film. Okay? Because highlights are just that. You know, well, they were just to get, if you want to get the attention at the beginning, but a coach usually put them aside. They if request it's, your If it's game. basketball, lacrosse, soccer, I usually put them at three minutes. Right. Three minutes. You don't want to, the attention spans, those coaches are going down too, like everybody else with these phones. Okay? So, yeah. But if it's another sport, you might need longer, you know? And then, like you said, they're always going to ask for full game, though. They'll ask for full game. But make it against good competition. When you had a good right. game against good competition. One more. So what do you do for filming for uh, track and field and cross-country? Good one. So track and field, I think you could film those. Cross-country is a little harder. You could maybe film the start and finish for you. But track, you can definitely film and, and let the coach, because those coaches want to see stride length, and they want to see the build, and they want to see you know, how you do at certain points the race. I'm not a track coach, actually I was. I did coach track two years. But uh, it, it's one of those things where it can be, it can be valuable. It's more about times. Times, 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 times. You know the times, they know the times. It's pretty, makes, it makes things a little easier. Uh, if you want any more, I think we gotta go, we're past time here, so feel free to text me and I'll schedule a, uh, a conversation. And also, one more thing. Please, 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 if you know other people that want information. Pass on my name and number. I'll be more than happy to talk to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. 